these occasions. Maybe I should just dispatch the question first of all. Is classical music elitist? Well, of course it is. I'm tempted to say, as, as they say in America, hell yeah, you know. <laughs> I, I, I think is the real answer. Um, but uh, just before I move on to what I prepared, uh, I was struck, you know, uh, on the way here, I was thinking, isn't it odd that we're gathered together to talk about this? And I thought, why? You know, what, what, why has this subject come up? It's so odd. Because, um, because it's, it's not a value, it's not a neutral question, it's not value free, it's, it's not a purely empirical thing. It's driven, I think, and this, this is not the first time I've discussed the question of whether classical music is elitist or not. We seem to be talking about it all the time. Why? And it, it seems to become a, a source of anxiety. It's something we fret about. There's a suggestion that if it turns out that it is elitist in some way, we ought to be jolly worried about that. You know, we, we need to do something, perhaps, to make it less so. And it strikes me that this is the most bizarre phenomenon. Because what other human society in the, in the entire course of recorded history has ever, <coughs> has ever been in a, a, a time when uh, certain members of the elite of that society, as, as I think we probably all are in this room in a way, um, have manifested an anxiety about, about belonging to an elite? When has that ever happened before? It, it's always been a source of pride in the past, hasn't it? You know, it's something you want to belong to. Who wouldn't, after all? You know, um, but here we are, slightly anxious about it, and having to, as it were, exculpate classical music from the sin of being elite. <laughs> and I'd strike, I would like to suggest, first of all, that's a bizarre situation to find ourselves in. Why should we be look, looking for some reason to excuse it somehow? So I just park that for a moment and, and um, um, move on to the question of when this oddity happened. When, when did it come about, this, this reversal of opinion, <clears throat> this reversal of valuation happened? Or to put it a different way, when, when was classical music's high <coughs> noon? You know, when did it reach its apogee of status, uh, um, f financial clout, and reach in the media? And I would suggest it was maybe in the 1950s or 60s. It, when you look back to that golden age now, you know, when, when Arturo Toscanini had his own show on the television. Isn't that amazing? You know, and NBC, the NBC broadcasting company created an orchestra for him, especially for him. <laughs> it was a time when, I remember this myself, you know, a bit later, you, you could go to a record store in a little town in England, if you manifested a slightly nerdy enthusiasm for a classical music, as I did at that age, and the person running a record shop would be able to advise you. They'd say, oh no, you, you don't want those Beethoven quartets, you want these. You know. Can you imagine that now? You know? Can you imagine, you know, a record company, a, a broadcasting company setting up its own uh, orchestra? Um, I mean, turning to now, of course, many things remain in place, you know. Uh, um, we still have our state-subsidized orchestras. We still have um, broadcasting companies uh, that, that reserve channels specifically for classical music, uh, as, as they have done throughout the decades. Um, more so in some countries than others, you know, I mean, Germany things seem very secure, in the United Kingdom and the United States less so, you know, the, the, these things have been open to the pressures of the marketplace. And so, um, the, super, the structure of classical music is now under threat, uh, uh, on a material basis, you know, funds are being withdrawn, you know, orchestras are closing, you know, uh, or threatened with closure. Um, uh, so that it's threatened on a material basis, and on the basis of reputation and, and status, it's being attacked for the various uh, historical crimes that have already been described to us by Werner and um, Tekla. Um, so um, I, I would like to sort of, um, in a sense, mount a defense of it, which I hope won't repeat too much of what we've already heard. I've, I approach it from a slightly different angle, um, this question of why this art form might be valuable and might deserve to be the attention of elites like us in this room and, and elsewhere. So I, I'd like to just part the word elite and substitute for it a different term, high. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I see an ironic chuckle from the room there. Um, but why? Because it prizes the topic away from the idea of social elite. I, I'd like to suggest that it's, it's, it has this, this altitude is rooted in something else. 
um, you know, it's, it, it's more than just being a member of a money class. And I'd like to, calling on um, the work of other philosophers, uh, this is not original to me at all, people like Roger Scruton, of course, the name I'm sure is known to you, um, and Andy Hamilton is another philosopher of, of culture who shares some of Scruton's views but is more hospitable to pop music and jazz. Um, I'd say there are five key features of, that make culture high, or might make a certain manifestation of culture high. One, humanism. It's more than a diversion or an entertainment, although it can, and I, I would even say should, be those things as well. It has an educative aspect. It opens up hearts and minds to aspects of experience that we may have not have encountered before in our daily run of things. And it educates those feelings. I would say an encounter with great, mu great music, great classical music, and other arts is an education in feeling as much as anything else. Two, heritage, or perhaps patrimony. I'm not quite sure what the word, right word is. It's an inheritance handed down from one generation to the next. And this handing down is more than just reading a book about it. Uh, it's a kind of initiation. It may come from professors and Worth remembering, isn't it, that the word professor in its old meaning means, means to profess something. You, know, you, you don't just have a bundle of facts at your disposal, you, you assert the value of something, you profess it. Um, so that's, I would say, is the heritage aspect. The aspect of judgment, um, I mean, which comes not just from people like me, but it comes when you go to the pub afterwards, <laughs> you know? You go to the pub after the concert and you chat about it. And it, it, it may not yield formal judgments of value that, are, that would stand in a, in a, you know, a, pretty, a publishable quality, but you come away poss quite possibly enlightened by them. You know, your, your, your judgment of it would have been refined in <coughs> conversation. So it, there's this, at different levels, an education of taste takes place, I would say, um, through the practice of high art uh, and classical music. Maybe not exclusively so, we can come on to that later. Four, elitism. Yes, it, it was indeed, as, as Werner so eloquently described, the creation of social elites in the past. It no longer is. Um, I think it's become elite in a different way, which I'll move on to in a minute. F number five, lastly, common meaning, inclusion. What I, by which I mean, and this is something Werner also talk, touched on and you also tackled, which is that the materials of classical music are not... Are not all of 100% exclusive to it. It shares many of its materials with other kinds of music which are not high. And that's really vital. Uh, if, it, if that were not the case, classical music would live on a desperately lonely peak, wouldn't it? It would be, it would be marooned on this, on this peak of eminence and nobody would understand it. Um, a peak, I have to say, in which some modernists would like to put it. Um, more fool them, I say. You know, I think a lot, they did a lot of damage to the art form by trying to do that, by trying to cut it from the common ground. Um, so, I think if I just, if you don't mind, John, I'll just run through those five again, just to connect them very quickly with classical music specifically. Yes, it presents us with many different ways of thinking and feeling, and also, I would say, implied movement. I think when you listen to music, it is a kind of implied, a kind of virtual dancing. You sort of mentally dance with it. I would say, or move with it. Um, and it reminds us of other human possibilities and other ways of feeling. Worth saying again, because that can be a stick with which to beat classical music. Some people bring forward the fact that, for example, Mozart teaches you to feel in a different way as a reason to despise it. They say, oh, it's not relevant then. It's not relevant. You know, why do we want to know how Mozart felt? Um, and you know, I, I deplore this tendency to, to want to lock us into the present moment. We see it, I, I don't know whether it's the case in the countries you come from, but in Britain, you know, literature is more and more increasingly judged does it speak to me? Meaning, does it reflect my experience? You know, to which I say, no, but who cares? Plus, you know, let's hear about someone else's. And classical music does that through music. The patrimony of music is number two. Um, it's this vast body of music, but it's more than that. It's also a set of rules, I would say, techniques, uh, what we call in English rules of thumb. I don't know whether you have that. I don't know if other languages have that phrase. It's sort of handy rules. Not exactly rules, but how you do stuff. It's, that, it's, it's a rule of thumb that tells you that the bottom B natural on a bassoon isn't very good. 
don't use it because it's weak. And that's what I mean by a rule of thumb. Um, and what's very interesting is that the rules and the patrimony, the body of works, exist in, an in, in a very fascinating tension. So Bach's music, for example, in, in a sense, is the source of many of the rules. And yet Bach often broke them. You know, there's a, there are passages in Bach's music that if you presented them to a harmony teacher, they'd get you put the red, pe red pen through. You know, he'd say, try again, uh, because he's broken a rule of some kind. Elitism. Um, well, <laughs> yes, uh, it was, as Werner pointed out, the creation and it was supported by and made by elites, but I would say it is no longer because um, whereas those historical elites were closed. The, the wonderful thing about the contemporary elites which make and share classical music is it is, a, it is an open elite. You join it by walking through that door and listening to that symphony concert. You, you join the, that elite by turning on uh, uh, BBC Radio 3 or Rai 3 in Italy or whatever it is in Belgium. Um, it's incredibly easy to join it. You walk through the door, you turn the radio on. Uh, you might not get it all at first, but eventually you will. Um, finally, common meaning, uh, inclusion. Um, I sort of said it really, but I'll just remind you what I said, um, <laughs> which is that the classical music material is, is sh sh as it were, sh fades away or is proceeds by shading off uh, into other areas of music. You know, uh, its materials are m mostly, I would say, shared with, you know, hymns, <coughs> marches, Folk songs, you know, they have many things in common, materially. Um, I, I'm, I'm, a couple of final remarks, because I'm, I'm sure John's looking at the clock. Um, uh, how does this all apply to the present moment? Well, as I said at the beginning, it's most odd that we should be debating these things. Um, you know, there's a strange kind of magical thinking, isn't there, which I think is taking root nowadays, um, which says that... Um, if something in the world conflicts with our cherished ideology, um, if we shout about it enough and, and sh say that we disapprove of it enough and loudly enough, that thing will magically disappear in, in response to our shouting. I mean, the binary nature of human sexuality, dare I say, is one such example. You know, there are people out there who think as if, if they deny it long enough, it will indeed vanish. Um, um, but now the same, I think, the same I think is true of elitism, honestly. I think it's a <coughs> Ben may want to quarrel with this, I'm no social scientist, but it seems to me that the urge to, to be dis, to distinguish oneself and to rise up and join, <coughs> join an elite of some kind or other is an ineradicable part of human nature. And it's not going to vanish. Just because a bunch of over-anxious people say, oh dear, I'm a bit worried about classical music. Oh, that's a bit elitist, isn't it? What can we do? You know, how, how can we take it down off its pedestal? I would say this is exactly the wrong way to value it. Put it back up there. I'd say, put it on that pedestal, and everyone will want to go on it, because everyone wants to be part of an elite, honestly, especially an open one, especially one that's relatively easy to join. So stop fretting about it. Stop fretting about the fact that it's elitist and rejoice in it. It's, it's, a, it's a product of an of and for an open end. And that's a marvellous thing. You know, I think I might just stop. Yeah. I, I think it's enough, <laughs> <laughs>